Hi, everybody. Hello, I'm Ryan. I'm Bethany. And we are Ryan and Bethany of Board Game Reviews. And today we're going to talk about Viscounts of the West Kingdom, and this is published by Renegade Game Studios in partnership with Garp Hill Games. In this game, there is uh, a king, and that king is doing things that we don't like, so we are trying to figure out whether we're partnering with him or not partnering with him. We're being loyal, but... Also, none of that matters, actually. <laughs> so what we're really doing is we're just like a dude on a horse walking around the board doing actions. Like, do you mean like a Viscount? A Viscount on a, a Viscount is like, dude is like translated for Viscount. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Learn yeah. new things <laughs> dude on a, a dude day. on a horse walking around doing actions. That is in the West Kingdom. Yeah, that's actually, if you look up Viscounts in the dictionary, it it's says dude, dude on, on a horse. horse. <laughs> doing actions, walking around doing actions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you what, what that dude looks like while he's doing his actions. All right, here is our individual player boards. We've got our dude on a horse, a.k.a. our Viscount. He's going to be roaming around the board, which I will show you that part of the game later. We've got all of our workers. Those are going to come into handy uh, when we start doing some of our actions. I wanted to show you this. Uh, there's a couple things that's going to happen. We all have the identical starting deck of eight cards. Uh, they have a kind of yellow band for our yellow player colors. It's going to tell us uh, who they belong to. And they all have different values and different items on the top left corner. That's going to be important as far as what actions they're going to be able to help out and make stronger. Now, at the beginning of the game, what we're going to do is we are going to have a whole bunch of these cards that basically say you have different starting resources. So different, you know, amount of cards, uh, different amount of gold, different amount of resources, a whole bunch of these different things. And then we have additional kind of advanced uh, cards here as well, advanced, advanced town people. And what you're going to do is you're going to shuffle up these cards and these cards. You're going to pair them up like that, have a set like that, another set like that. Oops, I'm doing this weird in my hand here like this. But you're going to have all these different pairings like that. And what's going to happen is, starting in reverse turn order, someone's going to be able to, be able to choose a pairing, uh, which gives them a starting resources, as well as a starting card to put into their deck. All right, let's say we chose these two here. So we've got uh, Loth there, who's going to help us out every time. Uh, a lightning bolt there indicates that when you play him for the first time, he gives you all those goods, which is really strong. Uh, the top left of the card tells you how much movement you're going to get out of your horse. Uh, in this case, it's only one. It's also the cost of the card once they're on the board, and I'll show you that later as well. And again, this is, tells you, this kind of blue money bag there, shows you what kind of action Hube is going to be able to help out with. And again, this card is going to tell you what kind of starting resources you get. So we've got deck cards as well as land cards. This tells you that you need to trash a card before the game even begins, which can be really uh, helpful to kind of steer your, your strategy in the right direction, as well as some money and resources. And that little guy right there is going to tell you where on the main board uh, your Viscount is going to start out. All right, so now that the game is starting, we're going to shuffle our deck. We're going to draw three of the cards, and that's going to be our hand. You're going to choose one of them to play. So let's say we chose uh, this one here. We're going to put it out on our board. Now, there's right in this symbol right here that says that whenever he is kind of upright on this tableau right there, this action is available to us. There's also going to be things that say lightning bolts like we talked about earlier. Oops, let me see if I that down. And then that X means right there, that benefit happens, or in this case it's kind of a good thing, kind of a bad thing. When she's over here, kind of cards are going to be kind of sliding down when you play them. This one, when it drops off, that's when that effect happens like that. So whenever you see that X, that's what that's referring to. One of the actions that you'll be able to take on the main player board is to be able to build things. And when you build something, you're going to place it on the board, and it's going to uncover a special action, kind of an up updated version of an action uh, on the board here. So as you keep on building, more and more things get unlocked. Also, you kind of see the, the yellow flags there. Every time you see a yellow flag, that's referring to victory points. The more buildings you build, the more victory points you are going to get. In the middle here, we kind of have a tracker. This is our corruption tracker. And that is our virtue tracker, that white one over there. All right, so those are kind of going to move forward and backwards every time you gain certain amounts of, you know, uh, corruption and virtue. This might go up every time you get more corruption. This is going to go down every time you get more virtue. Whenever those two things combine, they touch for the first time, they're now stuck together for the rest of the game. And what's going to happen is once they're stuck together, uh, there's going to be all these benefits across the kind of that top row of that track there. So let's say you're all the way up here, most virtuous one. Uh, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to get three of those land cards as well as a coin every turn. However, if you're all the way down here, you're going to get three of those debt cards, as well as a whole bunch of money. And as well, as there's also a bottom track down below here. All your opponents are going to get that track. So this says, for instance, uh, if you have any uh, criminals in your, in your area, uh, you are going to get some debt. So that's a bad thing. So why is all that important? Why is it important to draw or all those different reds and black cards? 
Well, that's kind of the end game trigger. There's a whole huge stack of these deck cards and an equally large stack of those red land cards as well. And what's going to happen is there's, you know, based on the number of players, there's going to be a certain number of them above that card there and a certain number of them be below. And as you're dishing them out throughout the game, once that card is revealed, that triggers the end of the game. But <laughs> there's going to be some bonus points here scored. If uh, whoever has the, if this one is revealed first, let's say that black one is revealed by a whole bunch of these black cards being given out, then the <laughs> whoever has the most amount of red cards flipped over is going to get 12 victory points. And in conversely, uh, the other side of cards here, the red ones. If that goes out first, basically what's going to happen is uh, whoever has the most amount of black cards flipped over is going to get 12 cards. Uh, so <laughs> there's like kind of a push-pull going on here. You want to kind of accumulate both of them equally, so that way uh, once the game end is revealed, you have a lot of both, so that means you're making sure that you have a lot of points at the end of the game. So in regards to the tracks up here, maybe it's not a bad thing. You're getting a whole bunch of reds, everybody else is getting a whole bunch of blacks. Because at the end of the game, if the black pile is revealed, and the, then in that case, whoever has the most reds, which might be you, it's going to get a bunch of points. And same thing in reverse. So like I said, it's kind of a push-pull kind of a situation. You want to be in a situation where you're going to get a lot of points regardless. The player board itself is also kind of a nice handy guide as far as what a turn is going to look like. So what's going to happen is you're going to, you know, draw a card. Make sure you have a three-card hand limit. Uh, there are ways to get higher hand limits, but you're going to draw up to your hand limit. Then you're going to get some corruption based off if you have any criminals in your land or not. Then your movement phase happens. That's your little viscount symbol. He's going to walk around on the board, which I'll show you again. You're going to get a chance to uh, play some cards, get their benefits from the board. And then those are the four main actions that you can do. Um, I'll go over those again shortly here. You're going to have a chance to buy cards on the board. Then if your two things have combined, your virtue and your corruption things have uh, happened, that's when you acquire all those different uh, cards and money. And lastly, you're going to draw back up to your hand size. All right, now let me show you the main player board. All right, here is the board where we will be doing all of our actions. I don't know if how well you can see it, but there's these little arrows along the paths here that tell us where we can and can't go. So for instance, we could, you know, if we had one movement, we would go there. If we had three, we could go, you know, one, two, three, or whatever that looks like. You need to follow the paths, and wherever you land, that tells you what kind of actions you can do in that spot. For instance, in the inner ring there, where we currently are, those, there's two actions that we can do there. The first one is that we can transcribe manuscripts. So, on these little kind of books here, there is going to be a certain number of those cleric signs. In this case, it's three. And do you remember all those symbols that we talked about on those cards? One of those symbols, again, is that cleric symbol. You need at least three of those cleric symbols in order to claim that particular tile. However, if you do not have those cleric symbols, there's a couple things. For one, there's that criminal symbol, that kind of that purple skull. That is going to act for a wild for any of the symbols. Also, this is kind of inkwells resources that you're going to collect over the course of the game. Those can also count as uh, some of those cleric symbols. However, you have to discard these when they're done. So no matter what, you're going to get that. It's going to give you some kind of a bonus, some kind of a benefit. Maybe it's resources, maybe it's cards, maybe it's points. And then also, there's kind of a set collection mechanism. Each one of those has a little ribbon color on it. And if you get a certain number of those ribbon colors, I think it's three of each, uh, you're going to get some extra victory points as well as some in-game bonuses, like extra symbols to use to, to buy things later on. The next action that you can do from the middle ring there is called placing workers. All right, so what's going to happen for that is that symbol is going to be... Um, this kind of yellow one here in the top corner. Basically that symbol uh, is gonna be how you do that. One symbol is gonna get you one person in the middle there. Three symbols will get you two, five will get you three, and eight will get you four people. All right, so we're gonna start placing people down the middle of the board here on the outer ring of this ca castle here. Once you have three in a given area, they kind of explode. Like there's, there's, there's too many people too close together. And when that happens, one person's going to go to the right, one person's going to go to the left, and one people, person advances to the middle. In that middle ring, there's going to be some extra bonuses. Like in this case, for instance, we're going to get to advance our virtue track twice. But the more you use that action, the more and more people are going to be in that middle section. So the same thing that happens here, what's going to happen is, this person's going to jump over here, do that special ability they've earned. This person's going to go over here, do that special ability, and one's going to advance to the middle. The middle, you're going to get a wild resource, any one of these over here, which can be really nice. But also, at the end of the game, it's going to be with more victory points. And the first person to play someone in the middle is going to get some extra rewards as well. Now, in order to do that, again, we talked about having that little yellow symbol there on that card. Also, again, the criminal symbol. And then for the resource, it's going to be paired up with gold. You can use gold as well to get up to that certain threshold you need in order to place more workers. 
So that is the inner track. On the outer track, like over there, uh, there's two actions you can do there. The one that you can do is building. Each building that you place uh, is either going to cost you three, five, or seven of that symbol, the building symbol. Let's see if I can find one of those. That top left there is that building symbol. And again, like always, the stone is going to be the resource that you can use as kind of a additional uh, symbol as well, as well as always the criminal symbol. For each spot on the outside part of the board, there's going to be two spice spots where you can build. So when you build that over that, a couple things are going to happen. First of all, you get to whatever you uncover or whatever you cover up is going to be a resource that you can gather. Also, remember on our board, there's going to be special abilities that you can unlock as well. And at the end of the game, you're going to get victory points. But if someone else comes along later and builds next to you, uh, they're going to get all the rewards that they get. There's also going to be some resources in the middle between two building spots, and both players would get that reward as well. Now, the last action you can take is trade. Trade happens on the outside part of the board. Each spot along the outside is going to have a separate trade uh, resource. Like this one says here, take two of those blue money bags for one gold. And you can do it multiple times. So like six could equal three golds. Or over here, you can do one money bag equals one gold. Or rather, one uh, coin. And over here, there's, you know, four of those blue bags equals uh, flipping over either a red or a black card. That can be really strong as well. So all those different things are called trade. And depending on where you are, that's the benefit that you get. And just like all the other actions, you can use uh, coins to substitute in for having those uh, blue bags uh, in order to get more of the certain resource that you're trying to get. You can buy the top card of the deck to put it into your deck. It goes in your discard pile. Whatever this top left coin value is, is how much it's going to cost. And then again, uh, later on in the game, when you actually place it, that's also how much your uh, Viscount is going to be able to move. Now, there is one extra mechanism that you can use. You can actually dismiss the top card of the deck and, and kind of use that symbol as kind of a, a symbol to help you out as well. So let's say out in front of you on your tableau, you've got uh, three of those, those yellow icons and you've only got one gold, but you really want to place three of your guys in that middle section. In order to get a fifth symbol, um, you can actually pay the cost at the top corner to dismiss them, get them out of the game, and therefore use that symbol uh, in order to accomplish what you need to do. So remember, every turn you're going to kind of follow along on your own player mat and do all the actions as they come up in order. And then uh, basically whenever that uh, certain either the land cards or the deck cards, you reach that middle part of the deck based off the number of players, the game is going to end after one additional round. So you want to get all the victory points you can from buildings, from placing people in the middle of the little castle there, uh, from all the different set collection items you can do from these transcribes, uh, transcribing manuscripts and all the different you know things that you can get on the player board as well and all those different land cards so there's a whole lot of ways to get victory points you want to maximize all the areas that you can and whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins one of the things that i think this line of games does really well and this game is no exception to that is they really utilize their space well so they have fun artwork that blends in but it doesn't detract from the game at all and it's not like they have these big things for no reason like every space serves a purpose on the board and I think it's one of the things that makes it to where it's not this huge board like they really slimmed it down to what it needs to be they put it in the small box that I like I know there's contention with these boxes but I like them and so I just like that they're they're really good which is like the space management is that a word is that like a thing space management it sounds like what you do when you're like the boss <laughs> of like outer space <laughs> like, space management. Uh, what's your resume oh, I'm in, I'm in space management I'm a space manager <laughs> <laughs> all right so there's you know i really like games that have multiple paths to victory this is like the definition of multiple yeah. paths literally and figuratively because they're paths because there's a dude on a horse doing paths on actions <laughs> actions on paths uh so, <laughs> so yeah there's like basically four main actions that you can do and you can you know you can really drill down on one of them or maybe even two of them uh but they all are completely viable they're all going to give you a bunch of points and yeah. and special abilities and actions as well um i will say that if you try to do like three or four if the, all four of them try to do them all equally it's not going to work out well for you you're going to try to be one of those like you know jack of all trades master of yeah. none kind of a thing I mean, you might enjoy yourself while you're yeah, playing, but you true. definitely will not win at <laughs> yeah, all. I agree. <laughs> I really liked how the card tableau worked. Not so much when the drafting and all of that, which was still fun, and I like that, but how 
the cards each have these special abilities, but they also have an ability on when they're placed on the board. So there's some that have an ability immediately when you place them. There's some that only have an ability when they come off of the board. So you can use their their um, special actions or whatever you want to call them on the top, but you only get that really cool action when it goes off the board and so you might rearrange your cards if you get the chance to make that one go off sooner and then there's some cards that give you benefit the entire time that you're playing it or you can use it in place of a different benefit and I just thought that was super neat to have like not only the actual thing that the card is doing and why you're you know getting it but also this thing of when it's placed and when it goes off the board. I liked the corruption in the virtue track I thought that was a really clever way of um Basically, giving the game a timer almost. You know, yeah. you could try to delay it as often, those, the meeting of those two things as often as as much as possible. But once you know you're combined, once those are touching and they're moving around together, and you're going to draw more of those cards, the, the game pace really picks up at that point. That's when oh, the kind yeah. of oh, yeah. that's when like the game you're like, oh shoot, I'm not, I'm only halfway done doing yeah. whatever it is. I need to start you know ramping it up on my end as well. Yeah. Um, I thought that the thematically that that was like one of the things that, that kind of worked well you know if you have a thief they're obviously going to be corrupt if you have some kind of a um uh, what was the guy that you're starting deck i can't remember it was the, the priest kind of guy he's yeah. giving you more the virtue abbot, abbot yeah. yeah he's giving more virtue going on so i, I like how that works together um yes yeah, so i like that maybe you want to delay it maybe yeah. you want to push the pace i like that those, those options were there for you those decision points yeah i like games that have a self timer like that where it's not an exact amount of turns but you can see as the game is ending and i think that's really really fun to have that i do have to say um, and this is totally a Bethany thing. This has nothing to do with the game. But if you're a gamer at all like me, if you pick up fist counts and your brain just isn't like working that day, I would put fist counts down and maybe learn a different game. Because I know that when Ryan first taught me this game, my brain wasn't fully functioning at that moment. And I just went to bed confused. I had no idea what had happened or why, and I just remember being really confused. That's not to say like that changed, of course, in multiple games, but the first time I was just confused. Well, I think I can speak to that point because um, this game was not really easy to teach for me. And the reason is when games have their mechanisms and um, point win conditions, all that kind of stuff, tied to what the theme of the game is, it's really easy for me to teach and explain. This to me felt disconnected, disjointed from the theme to the mechanisms, uh, and therefore it, it wasn't easy to teach. It was like, you're going there, I don't know what you're doing exactly, you're, you're hiring guys, you're breeding guys, dudes are appearing on, I don't I don't really know what's happening, why you're doing it, and why the king's mad at you about it. I don't, I mean, I, who or knows? happy with you. Yeah, who, yeah. yeah. Um, so the theme just didn't work for me, and as a result, it made it hard to teach, which might have been why it was a little bit harder to learn. Um, so that's one of the things about this line of games, I think that they've done a good job of is making some super solid mechanisms. The theme hasn't always been super strong, and this, I'd say, was the, is the worst defender of them all. Um, that being said, I just had a fantastic time playing. Yeah. This is, you know, once you once you get it and you get what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you get the points, um, man, I just had a really fun time playing this. Um, and I guess the, now we've played all three of them too. I guess it's time to ask which which was your favorite. So my favorite was, I don't know, I like all of them. I'm sorry, I can't decide. Don't make me choose. It's like choosing between my children. Why would you do that? Your children are board games. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, so I would see no reason to not have all of these games. Okay. You know, there's some games, if you like worker placement especially. Exactly. If you like worker placement, they all do something different. It's not like you have one game and like a different version of that same game where this one's kind of better than that one. I don't feel that way with this one. I felt like Viscounts did something completely different and obviously did. It had the cards and the other games didn't have the cards like that. I mean, they had cards... You know what I'm saying. They had cards, you use them differently. Yes, you use them differently. And I just felt like, if you like worker placements, there is a space for all of these games on your shelf. And I, frankly, I just don't see this one leaving. It will stay with us. Yeah. Like our ch children. It's true. They're, they're staying with us, too. That's good news. <laughs> uh, I would say that when we first played this, uh, I, I thought it was fantastic. I loved it. I played it again, and I was like, eh, you know, it's okay. It's fine. I played it again. I was like, this is so great. I can't believe it. And then I played it again, and I was like, I don't get it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so I'm all over the place with this one. Um, 
I will say that uh, at, at, when I first played it, I thought it was the top of all the the West Kingdom games for me. I think it's probably sitting in the middle right now. I think uh, Architects of the West Kingdom is currently my favorite. I, I really like the, the attention that gives and the, you know, putting people in jail. I thought that was a great mechanism. Paladins, I, I thought that had a, a really fun, like, kind of a, a teeter-tottering thing going on, similar to how this game had the, yeah. uh, the debt and the whatever the land cards are. Okay, you guys, before recorded, Ryan actually <clears throat> said that this game was his least favorite in the line and his favorite in the line. Take with that what you will. So, as of right now, as of this <laughs> very moment, I'm going to call it middle of the pack. <laughs> so, he's officially said all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then I'll put Paladins, Paladins at the bottom, but that'll change too because I really like Paladins. It will change with like whichever one you play with. Probably. Whichever one's the most recent one in my mind is probably the one I like the best. But they're all, I guess it's a testament to how good That's they how strong yeah. they are. You know, they're all worthy of being. Uh, Games owned and played. Are, owned and played. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so you can see our videos as they come out. And you can also find us in all the places on Facebook, we're Ryan Bethany Board Game Reviews. On Twitter, we are Ryan Bethany One. And on Instagram, we are Ryan and Bethany. And don't forget to stay tuned to the very end for our pounds and inches update. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for staying tuned to our pounds and inches update. This is where Ryan and I like to talk about the things we're doing to try and achieve better health in our life. And I actually just wanted to send out a reminder um, that if you're interested, we actually have a blog that we keep on Board Game Geek. It's called Pounds and Incher Inches as an um, you know, as a throwback to our to our origin story. So if you want to look for us on there, Pounds and Inches, it's a blog that we keep just kind of that I keep to just talk about my whole journey. I go really in depth in there. So if you're ever wondering what's actually happening behind the scenes, I would definitely just check that out. And I will put the link below in the description. Let's check that out there. All right. Well, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.